welcome to you all and welcome to the Global Trade and Blockchain Forum 2019. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Gann, I lead WT work on blockchain and I'll be the master of ceremony during these two days. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the WTO Global Trade and Blockchain Forum. This year, we decided to upgrade the event into a two-day conference to allow a deeper dive into a technology that is seen by many as a potential game changer for international trade. Let me begin by thanking our economic research and the statistic division for having put this event together. My thanks also go to all the colleagues from other divisions who took the lead in organizing specific sessions, in particular colleagues from the agriculture and the commodity divisions, the de development division, the enhanced integrated framework, the international uh, the intellectual property government procurement and competition division and the trade and the environment division much has happened since we had our first event a year ago the level of activity around distributed ledger technologies colloquially termed blockchain in the area of trade is in is very impressive the number of consortia and initiatives that leverage blockchain to remove frictions along the supply chain, facilitate the trade finance process and the border procedures, help fight counterfeits and facilitate the management of intellectual property rights has been skyrocketing. Like with any new technology, there has been a hype, no doubt, but the good news is that some of these projects are now moving into production. Where do we stand? What is the potential of blockchain to transform international trade? We are launching today a new publication with Trade Finance Global and the International Chamber of Commerce that provides an overview of the main projects and the way in trade with a focus on trade finance, shipping, and the digitalization of trade documents. Based on a survey of more than 200 actors in, in the field, this publication discusses the key challenges that companies involved in blockchain trade-related projects are facing, and discusses actions that may need to be taken to allow the technology to truly transform international trade. The, public, the publication also provides an estimate of the stages of maturity of various projects listed. On average, trade-related blockchain initiatives are between the pilot and early stages of production. In a moment, you will hear a more detailed presentation of this study. This forum will give you an opportunity to hear directly from practitioners in the field about some of these projects, the opportunities they open for international trade, and the challenges that needed to be addressed. While many of these projects are driven by companies, an increasing number of governments and public entities are also looking into the technology. I'm delighted that we have with us today two keynote speakers who will share their vision of blockchain from a public perspective. Dr. Marwin Azarani, who is member of the Dubai Future Council for Blockchain Technology and CEO of the Dubai Blockchain Center, and Ms. Helen Kopman, who is Deputy Head of Digital Innovation and Blockchain at the European Commission. A big thank you to both of you 
for having come all the way to Geneva. The trade landscape is changing very fast, driven by technological developments. A myriad of projects endeavor to make trade more efficient, more transparent, and more inclusive. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Deputy Director General Yi. It is, as usual, uh, uh, an utmost pleasure to be here in Geneva at uh, the World Trade Organization. As you know, uh, we are the staunchest supporters of the uh, rules-based multilateral trading system. Uh, just uh, in October, we released a manifesto on how to support the reform process of the World Trade Organization, and certainly looking specifically at new trends and how uh, such an important organization ought to look like and adapt to uh, technological changes and to be uh, the most relevant organization we can have in the 21st century. Um, I was recently uh, in, uh, in Vienna, and I attended a meeting just on Friday uh, with many former heads of state and prime ministers, and the issue there was really how to build the new sharing economy. And certainly some, uh, most of the uh, discussions actually said, well, what we need is in digital trade, uh, we need trust. And in order to build trust, well, one solution would be blockchain. Now, some others came and said, well, how can we trust blockchain? So that's a, that is a major issue. And certainly these are, uh, this is one of the, the of the themes that uh, we need to debate on, that we need to discuss on. And uh, um, as Deputy Director General Yi has said, uh, we uh, launched a couple of months ago already the uh, global trade and blockchain site under tradedialogues.org. So please join us uh, as experts in debating with the uh, international organizations that were mentioned, WTO, ICC, uh, WCO, UNC fact. Um, we feel that is an important uh, forum to debate and exchange on, on ideas, and certainly uh, we hope to be able to feed in into this uh, broader uh, discussion. So there are two things really, and very briefly, uh, I would like to touch upon. So how to build trust in this entire system? And um, I would say there's a need for two things. On one side, you need to be able just like in the currency markets, to have con convertibil convertibility uh, among currencies. So you need to be able to have a system whereby uh, different uh, players, different platforms can actually talk to one another, exchange with one another, and so you need interoperability. And in fact, I, I like in this new publication that was just uh, released the, uh, the idea of a periodic table of DLT projects. I think that's a brilliant idea. And in fact, it really captures what we uh, also want to pursue. So we're actually launching, or we have already launched, the Digital Standards Initiative, which will be run out of Singapore, which will also uh, look at uh, who is important in this sphere and really try to work on digital standards and interoperability. So that is one side. The other side of, the, uh, of that broad picture is really how do we ensure that we're not in the Wild West. So we still need, even in this area, in this new area, and of course technological developments are much faster than how public administration and international organizations can react, but we need as Deputy Director uh, Yi uh, referred to, we need a system of governance, we need a system of uh, regulations, we need a system that allows predictability uh, in this sector. So I think that's really uh, what this um, forum is meant to be uh, addressing. So we need to work towards that. We won't be able to uh, design all the solutions in one day or in two days, but I think it's important we get started in this process. And as usual, we're very pleased to have our, our logo associated next to uh, the WTO. So thank you all and uh, wish you good uh, debates. Ladies and gentlemen here in Geneva and to those who are listening to the live webcast of this conference all around the world, good morning and welcome to this second session of the Global Trade and Blockchain Forum. My name is Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global and host of the Trade Finance Talks podcast and publication. 
It's great to be back here in Geneva at the WTO. Emmanuel, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I'm delighted to be part of this panel session towards frictionless trade, the private sector perspective. And my panel, we've got Alyssa DiCaprio, Head of Trade and Supply Chain at R3, Bob Gravestein, Platform Innovator at Deliver, ABN AMRO, Dale Christie, Business Fellow and Blockchain Strategist at FedEx, and Louise Wiggett, CEO of Global Trade Solutions South Africa. So we'll be starting this panel session by talking about an exciting study authored by Emmanuel Gann uh, from the WTO and myself, which is now officially available for everyone to download and read. We will then move on to this fantastic panel session where we'll be discussing digitalization in terms of DLT and blockchain from a business model perspective. We'll be discussing why blockchain, where the industry has got to in 2019, and perhaps take a more forward-looking view at what we can expect over the next five years. We'll focus on removing the frictions from a trade, trade finance, transportation, and logistics perspective in this session. Now I'm going to start by talking about avocados, and it's probably back off the it's probably off the back of the WTA public forum uh, earlier on this year, where the perspectives of Gen Z and millennials on sustainable trade and its environmental impact was one of the key themes coming out of the forum this year. Many consumers don't understand the arduous journey that an avocado makes from farm to fork. The fruit's consumption has increased 150-fold uh, in the last 10 years, and many countries turn to international markets to import avocados, given the specific climate requirements to grow them. In 2014, Mesk followed a container of avocados from Kenya to the Netherlands to take a look at the paperwork, the actors, and the shipment route. And what they found in the 34-day process was that it took 30 actors over 100 people and 200 interactions. Of the 34 days of this process, 10 were spent waiting for documents. All that for a bit of healthy fat. And I think for all of you in this room as trade practitioners and advocates of digitalization in trade and supply chain, this is something we can get better at. And this is why we need innovators and thinkers who can bring trade to the digital age. So in partnership with the WTO and the ICC, we recently conducted a qualitative and quantitative survey of the current state and future perceptions of the role that DLT will have in the international trade industry, which I'll refer to later. We had over 200 responses from banks, corporates, fintechs, and industry associations, and we took a deep dive into around 39 different projects here on the board behind, behind me initiatives and companies within trade finance, shipping, supply chain, and insurance. So to illustrate the industry landscape of today, we've created this periodic table of DLT projects. This is aimed at trade practitioners, investors, consultants, vendors, and trade financiers to try and differentiate the 39 different initiatives, companies, and projects within trade. As you may know, Mendeleev's periodic table was initially made with international, with intentional blank spaces, intended to one day be filled with elements that were predicted to exist. And although it's often hard to visualize the minutiae and some of the nuances uh, of each individual actor, hopefully this is a starting point and it builds on our Gartner hype cycle evolutionary diagram that we produced earlier on this year. So as you can see, we've categorized, we've categorized the products into, into four broad initiatives, trade finance and supply chain finance on, on the left and supply chain digitization on the right with insurance and network of networks in the middle. We've then split this out into further, into further parts, which you can see by the different colors. So from shipping and freight related projects to trade documentation digitization projects, alluding to my avocado problem earlier. With this, we've added various underlying technologies such as Hyperledger Fabric, R3 Corda, and Quorum to help readers differentiate the key tech infrastructure. And we'll be discussing both interoperability between networks and also standardization on our panel session very shortly. Finally, we've analyzed most projects in terms of what the current stage of maturity for the various DLT projects is actually at. 
from the conceptual ideation phase to the proof of concept and production phases, right through to fully live and running. What's interesting here is that in our opinion, none of these actors are fully live and running and well established in the market yet. In fact, most are between the pilot phase and entering, entering into production, which shows that the industry is still very early on in adoption and there's much more to come. So what about our key conclusions, having spoken to and interviewed over 200 actors within banks, corporates, fintechs, and vendors? It's clear to tell that this is an exciting time for DLT in the trade industry, a time ripe with opportunities. And there were, broadly speaking, three main take-homes from the white paper. Firstly, probably the most cited opportunity for DLT in the trade and shipping space is its ability to streamline tedious processes driving efficiency and slashing costs. The cost saving for this digitization is twofold. First of all, automating the current labor intensive processes and reducing risk by making illegal practices such as trade-based money laundering increasingly more difficult to pursue. And DLT presents a tremendous opportunity to cut costs and improve efficiency in the trade and shipping space. Secondly, DLT is a, tr is a catalyst for change and innovation. And even if DLT isn't the end solution itself for the digitalization of, of trade. DLT has ignited the technological engine that could power huge changes throughout the trade industry. Perhaps even more important than its function, DLT has certainly been a catalyst for accelerating standardization. And one of the most profound opportunities that DLT holds is its ability to accelerate the standardization work that has been much needed in the trade industry for many years. Our white paper does, however, call for a reality check. Dreams aside, it's important to take a step back and understand the real problems and challenges that block the path ahead, and that this is what the panel session will discuss today. According to our surveys and research, the most pressing challenges facing the industry today surround technical issues like interoperability and others like standardization, legal concerns, and privacy. So now we're going to move on to the panel session. And Dale, I'd like to start off with you. If you could, if you could very quickly introduce yourself for a couple of minutes and, and what you do. Good day. Um, I'm Dale Christie. I'm business fellow and blockchain strategist for FedEx. Uh, I've spent my entire career in the transportation industry and I led the first blockchain use case several years ago at FedEx. We were trying to solve a dispute resolution area uh, between essentially shipper, receiver, and carrier. And as simple as that is, it actually scales very well in many examples. Uh, in this case, whether that was dispute resolution, you could also track financial transactions and things like that. Uh, one thing led to the next, and uh, the blockchain scenario has kind of taken off from that point of view. Uh, we are founding members of the Blockchain and Transport Alliance. I'm chairman of the Standards Council of that. Uh, we are also members of the Global Express Association. I'll speak to that in just a moment. We're also members of the Blockchain Research Institute uh, connected to Don Tapscott in Toronto. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Louise, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here and a real privilege to be talking to you. Um, my name is Louise Wiggett. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of a company in South Africa, Global Trade Solution. And our primary focus is to ensure that the international supply chain is covered from end to end. And naturally, blockchain was a huge initiative and a huge incentive for us to look at things and do things slightly differently. So I'll be sharing a story of um, a, um, application, and I hope it's a killer application, as it was referred to earlier with you today and to show how it actually can make life um, practically uh, easier and better. Thank you. Alyssa. Hey guys, um, my name is Alyssa DiCaprio. I work for R3, which is a company that builds and maintains the blockchain platform called Corda. So if you remember the periodic table over there, the ones that said COR, um, that's the platform that we work on. So we don't build applications. Um, we solely maintain the platform and we have an ecosystem of partners that then builds applications on top. So I'll be talking a little bit about what it looks like from a platform perspective, from solely the technology, what's happening in the ecosystem, um, rather than a specific project. Thanks. I'm Bob. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Bob Gravenstein. I'm working for ABN AMRO. Um, yeah, what I do, I try to make uh, trade accessible, easy, and uh, transparent. Uh, you can put all kinds of names to that as a business role, um, but I try to avoid that. Um, so I'm working on that, currently also involved in an initiative that's called Deliver. I will talk a little bit later about that. And initially also I've been involved in other blockchain uh, initiatives with the name of Congo and Bact, which are currently also mentioned in the periodic table where DTS is referring to. Thank you, Bob. So Dale, we'll start from you. And could you give us an overview of blockchain from a business model perspective and also alluding to your recent paper on co-opetition in the shipping and freight industry? Yes, again, um, from a FedEx point of view, um, one of the things I think is most important in a blockchain scenario is that I could be uh, a, an evangelist. I could be a single person talking about blockchain, but it's nowhere near as effective uh, as if you are connected all the way to the corner office. And so whether that applies in an enterprise scenario or government or others, uh, the point is the same. We've heard already this morning about silos and essentially that those are our enemy. So from our point of view, I would start by talking about our uh, iconic founder, Fred Smith. Um, 2018, he was at the consensus event in New York City and um, offered multiple comments about this, uh, the least of which is that he believes and we believe that this will completely change worldwide supply chains. That's tens of thousands of companies that we're talking about here. It's not one company or five companies. Uh, it's tens of thousands, all the way to a bike messenger, potentially. Uh, he also talked about the fact that if you're not operating at the edge of technology, you will be disrupted. And finally, if you're not really embracing this kind of, uh, uh, these kinds of things and, and these efforts, you need to be prepared to be commoditized or to potentially become extinct. And those are big words from a, from a, a, a leading a founder and CEO of an enormous company from that point of view. But I want to say, I want to start by saying that's how tightly we, we are aligned at the corner office from a FedEx point of view. And so it's from that position that we offer our uh, thought leadership in those areas. Um, I think it's also really important that we recognize that um, there's, a, there's a wide range of knowledge in this room about blockchain, uh, all the way from the most basic of questions all the way to the highest level of expertise in this room. I'm on the business and strategy side, so you're not going to hear technical references from me. Um, but what we do believe is important uh, is that lack of silos, is that this is not really an intuitive conversation, um, but it's really, really important that governments and agencies and many, many people are working together. And so examples on the screen include a World Customs Organization research paper uh, that closed by saying that blockchain is a giant leap for customs in the 21st century. Um, uh, Emmanuel's paper as well uh, speaks uh, to uh, the international trade could well look radically different in 10 to 15 years. And I mentioned a few moments ago, we are uh, members, uh, FedEx, UPS, and DHL are members of Global Express Association. Um, we have been working this year to uh, establish and provide and publish um, a position paper in blockchain and emerging technologies. And in our case, part of our call to action is the development of open standards and interoperability protocols. Um, those, those are very important that we're hearing these things. The EU conversation was wonderful and fascinating. And there's a lot of wonderful work here, but one of the things that we would challenge uh, this audience here in, in listening um, is that we have to work together. We have to work together on these things. It can't be something that we can do individually. So um, it's not um, you know, the race to the finish line first, much like the internet was. We actually think it's gonna be much bigger than that. And so again, these are the only basics I'll come up with and I'll spend 30 seconds on a, the next couple of slides. From my point of view as a business and strategy person, it's just data. You know, some people still think that blockchain is magic dust that you can sprinkle on something and it's going to grow six feet tall. Um, it's just data. Um, it creates a secure chain of custody. Um, it, I, I, you know, it creates a common data language. Uh, these aren't necessarily very exciting concepts, but they're transformative concepts. Currently, we all have different languages, whether that's based on country or industry or other types of things. And where we can come together in a common effort, we think that will be transformative. 
uh, peer-to-peer -peer impact. Another one, just very quickly, if you and I can find each other and do so in a trusted environment, we wouldn't necessarily need many of the steps that are in the way. We started this morning hearing from Dubai and other examples of that where, uh, we are, where there's people in the middle of these processes. So in our first effort around dispute resolution, a shipper, a receiver, and a carrier, it also occurred to me very quickly that from a FedEx point of view, Geneva to New York City, uh, could involve not only a carrier like FedEx, but it could also involve brokers, forwarders, lots and lots of people in the middle of that process. And we've already heard today the, uh, the, the excellent examples of how uh, if you and I can find each other and do so in a trusted environment, that may disrupt existing models. Uh, and finally, on the right side of the slide, what value do you provide is certainly not in any way a uh, a preachy kind of a point. It's simply look, let's look ourselves in the mirror and say, what value do we provide? And from an enterprise, enterprise point of view, many companies are a middleman or in a middleman role. That's not to say that um, that's either wonderful or horrible, but you should be well aware of this kind of technology because it will change many of those companies. And so, uh, again, this audience, as I would try to predict who's here, but trade officials and others from that point of view, we've covered some of this. I'll just make a, a quick point here. Uh, earlier this year, we've already done a couple of proofs of concept with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And, um, and they get it, and they have a 21st century vision that's very similar to uh, world trade, world customs, et cetera, and our GEA paper. Um, and basically, uh, in this case, as we described to them, data knows no borders. We envision a world around borders from that point of view, but that's not the way data works. And the sooner we can all kind of understand and embrace that and, and imagine what this might be, uh, the quicker we can accelerate this technology. And we talked about the current system within uh, the U.S., which is the ACE program, and that's represented on the right-hand side of that slide, where it gets to carrier and broker and et cetera, et cetera. In this case, um, the data could simply exist all the way upstream from the point, and the example that we used was that um, um, a lady ordered a laptop online with her phone with two-day delivery. Well, currently, U.S. Customs and Border Protection doesn't have processes that fits within that. They, it really fits within a retail environment and not an e-commerce environment. But you could literally, while I'm speaking, say that laptop I'm looking for is now on sale, and I hit the button, and there it is. In this case, this example on the left-hand side would go all the way back up to the dot-com. Who am I purchasing from? And within the U.S. example, is, does it already exist in the U.S.? Does it need to come into the U.S.? Because protecting, you know, safeguarding America's borders is their focus. So if it's already in the U.S., it doesn't matter to them. If it's not, however, they don't currently have visibility to some of those things. So one of our suggestions would be, as shown here, and that scales globally as well in, t in terms of that upstream, not only to the laptop as it is, exists as a laptop, but also ultimately up to the motherboard or to the other raw materials and other types of things. So in this case, um, I, I want you to envision this kind of looks maybe like Dubai a little bit, uh, kind of a very futuristic looking city, and, and this represents blockchain. So whatever any of you in the room think of as blockchain, I want you to envision it to be what's shown here on the right hand side of the slide. Um, and if you think, you know, there are many people in this room and listening, and here we are, and we're now represented on the left-hand side of this slide. Um, I would tell you that if we all know that blockchain is, uh, is a thing, it's coming, it's big, it's going to be transformative wherever we are, then we could all argue, well, it's right there in front of us, let's just go do it. Come on, let's go. Let's all get up right now, walk out of the room, and let's go do this. And I would just argue that there's just one problem with this, which is the, what, what we see, what we think we see in front of us and where this group of people in this room are is essentially separated by a canyon. And we think that there are many people that are going to be successful. There will be a few that will be successful in crossing that canyon on their own from an enterprise point of view and, and, and treating this as a proprietary solution. Um, essentially creating a toll bridge across that canyon. We actually don't think many people are going to be successful at doing that. We actually think it's going to take a coopetition, and that leads back to some of the examples and the discussions that we've talked about with FedEx, UPS, DHL, and others, where we actually think it's going to take all of us. We think it's going to take a big global village. We've heard multiple times already today about the need for open standards, uh, and we are uh, all in in that space. And we think in order to bridge that canyon, we think it's going to take all of us. 
um, from a um, blockchain and transport alliance. We're working on open and royalty-free standards, data standards. So whether that's bill of lading data or a zip code or postal code or other examples from that point of view. Um, but ultimately, we believe that uh, it won't be any one company from that point of view. Uh, publicly, we have said we don't believe we can put a FedEx logo on blockchain technology and put it out into the world. Our competitors wouldn't use it, we wouldn't use theirs, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is uh, a bit of a thought leadership position that's not yet intuitive from a U.S. point of view. Many people are still trying to treat this like the Internet, and they're trying to make it a proprietary solution, uh, the, uh, kind of with their blinders on from that point of view. So um, use cases, there are many, again, where authenticity matters. We think this will be transformative. That gets you to examples such as global clearance, um, uh, aerospace, aircraft parts, especially when you get into 3D printing and additive manufacturing and things like that. Um, uh, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, medical devices. There are many really good examples from that point of view, but we think supply chain is another really great example as well. Um, I started at the C-suite in the corner office. I'm going to finish in the corner office, which is whether you work for an enterprise or whether you work for a, a government or an agency or something like that, the point here would be the same, which is this can't just be an evangelist. Dale can't just be out here for FedEx and saying, this is a great thing, let's all go do this. Um, the C-suite, the people who are in charge, whether they're directors or, or government officials or CEOs or others, need to understand, if I'm the chief financial officer, I need to understand that smart contracts are going to be transformative to things as simple as my accounts receivable. Uh, it, once those are executable files, essentially, uh, I've now delivered it from Geneva to New York City. I did it on the right time. I kept it within the right temperature, the right humidity, et cetera, et cetera. Then that essentially micro payment will exist. That's going to fundamentally change the CFO. Uh, the chief information officer is going to need to have people who can program those smart contracts. The legal officer is going to need to have essentially bilingual attorneys who can speak not only paper contracts but also smart contracts. And Could the speaker please slow down the interpreters would appreciate it? It does require their expertise but it also requires them to embrace some new technology such as this as well. Uh, finally, we think there's an absolute connection between blockchain, uh, track and trace. Uh, you know, certainly people hear with FedEx and, and, and track and trace, and they think, oh, track and trace, FedEx, blockchain, that, that's what the blockchain focus is. It's in the track and trace. And we would tell you that we know where the package is already. We don't, we don't think blockchain actually helps us in that space at all. Blockchain is the literal ledger of things. I mean, I'm sorry, track and trace is the literal ledger of things. Blockchain is the virtual ledger of things. It's essentially connective tissue, um, and it gets you uh, accuracy and authenticity. Um, Internet of Things, sensor-based logistics, will now tell you not only where your package is, but how your package is, uh, temperature, humidity, et cetera, et cetera. And then there will be billions of data points on top of that that will provide essentially a near real-time supply chain. And that's where it really connects into the WTO uh, and uh, global clearance and those types of things as well. Um, and I'll finish with uh, a, a comment from our chief information officer, which again uh, backs up our comment. We don't think we can put a FedEx logo on this. We think for blockchain to be transformative, it has to be bigger than us. And that's why we're committed to a coopetition and an open environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dale, and I think some of those use cases are particularly important for many of the audience here in this room. So now we're going to go from the data and, and the high level in, into the details, and I'm actually going to pass over to Alyssa. Most people have heard of, of R3, I guess, from a quarter perspective and perhaps even a Marco Polo perspective, which I definitely come across quite, quite often. How has R3 developed its functionality to support some of its new clients? All right. Um, well, I think, you know, uh, before, you know, kind of get, getting into that, it, it might be useful to talk about what, why R3 developed Corda, because um, there was already blockchains available, right? I mean, we, and uh, initially, R3 started as a consulting company. Um, so we were building for a consortium of banks, um, different blockchain applications. Thank you. Uh, and we were building on Ethereum and Bitcoin blockchain and multi-chain and all kinds of random uh, public blockchains. But when it got to the point of implementation, so we said, here, banks, we've built this wonderful project for you. Put it into your internal security systems. They were like, absolutely not. There is no way we're putting a public blockchain into our internal security. 
So um, in order to continue to exist as a company, uh, we went back and we surveyed our banks and we said, okay, what do you actually need it to do? Um, they gave us a set of parameters and we brought that back and we built Corda. So Corda is a private permission blockchain. It's similar to um, uh, Hyperledger Fabric uh, in, in that respect. We do identity and confidentiality a little bit differently. Um, but so that's, that's why we built Corda. So it's, it's really focused on sort of the enterprise regulated sector um, perspective, but it's, it's since expanded out. Um, we started with finance and it's, it's expanded from there. Okay, so with that, um, I'll just talk a little bit um, about uh, frictionless trade. Okay, so I'm just gonna cover three quick topics. I have 10 minutes, I'll try to make it a lot shorter. The first uh, is why blockchain is so popular in trade, um, because that's not what Bitcoin was developed for, so how did that happen? Um, the second is how far did we get in 2019 and what are we actually seeing? Because remember, I'm coming from a platform perspective, I'm not talking about individual projects. Um, and finally, how are platforms uh, engaging in, in the, the global trade uh, agenda? Okay, so first, uh, why is blockchain you know, happening in trade? Well, I think we all know what's wrong with trade, right? It's, it's costly, it's slow, um, it's opaque, you don't always know where things are. Um, and while there have been innovations, uh, particularly in the financial sector, we've seen this since the global financial crisis, there's been a lot of digitization, which is great. And you have individual companies that are highly digitized, you have you know, different sectors that are digitized, um, but the problem comes with when you, when you have international trade and you're crossing borders, um, you might be fully digitized, I am not, you can give me your digital documents, I'm gonna ask you for a paper document anyway. Um, and so, you know, just the, the way that the infrastructure that we have globally for digitization just didn't, didn't really help this, this scale problem. Um, and so that kind of gets to the right side of this. So, you know, we know what's wrong with trade, but we, we really didn't have the right tools to fix it. But, you know, because if you think about trade, it's, it's a decentralized ecosystem, right? Um, you're always going to have different partners in different countries, different jurisdictions, different rules. Um, and so having a centralized solution required all the partners to be on one platform. That was always the way that, that we had it. So you could have innovations, but they were always centralized. And that doesn't work in a decentralized ecosystem. Um, so, so really, you know, blockchain is something that, that changes that. I'm not gonna go into this very much. This is just kind of thinking about, okay, well, what, what could you do with trade? Um, you know, given, what does blockchain let you do? Um, it makes sure that the data that you see is the same data that I see. Um, it, and that, it enables you to verify origin uh, in a way that's a, a, a little bit more succinct than the way that we verify origin today. Um, and it's a lot more cyber secure. I mean, again, the problem with digital solutions was that you required a central operator and that central operator could get hacked, right? I mean, this is where you have you know, credit card data getting hacked and, and Target and all of these things. Um, so blockchain solves or moves us forward on, on these different elements. Okay, so if, how far did we get in 2019? Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, um, so this is trade finance, which is slightly different from trade. Um, any, anytime you have trade, you're gonna need trade finance though, so I think this is useful to look at. Um, and what I did here is I, I just kind of looked at the ecosystem of different applications that are being built in trade finance today. Um, and, and the reason I kind of put this up is, first of all, so you can see it's enormous, right? There's not just one application, there's multiple applications. Um, there's also multiple applications on Corda. And the reason that I, I wanna point that out um, is also because um, you don't have just one application in trade finance. You don't have just one for documentary trade or one for open account. They all have different commercial structures. They work in different corridors. They might work in different regions. Um, so it really helps this ecosystem, I think in general, to have competition, to have more projects, uh, and to have you know really a, a lot of activity in the space. Okay. Um, so I wanted to be a little bit realistic about what is happening in 2019 because I think, you know, as the other speakers mentioned, um, there's a lot that blockchain could do, but like what is it actually doing? Um, and I think the periodic table pointed that out a little bit where it said like not a lot of stuff is actually live. Um, I would dispute that a little bit. <laughs> However, um, you know, let's, let's talk about, you know, what's, what's happened this year. The first is that there's not a single geographic hub for innovation. I think this has been really important. So, you know, a lot of times people are talking about projects and you think, oh, okay, well, they're started in the U.S. or they're started in uh, the U.K. But in fact, you know, what we see at R3 and on Corda is that there's a lot of projects that are starting in developing countries that are advancing much faster because maybe the regulatory environment is not as restrictive. 
Um, so these are, you know, just two examples um, where we do have very active projects in, in developing countries. Um, the second trend that we see in 2019 is really around a more equitable fintech bank relationship. And kind of what I mean by this is, is initially, you know, banking, when you're thinking about trade finance, saw fintech or startups as uh, competitors. Uh, so this was something that, okay, well, uh, they're, they're trying to take over our market share. And I, and I think you see this in, in other sectors as well. Um, you know, how do you treat these, these kind of startups? Um, and I think over 2019, it's become a lot more less of competition and more of like, okay, well, how do we work together? Um, and, and so one really interesting uh, example of this is, is Cybos, which is this large sort of uh, banking conference that uh, happens every year. Historically, fintechs have been on a different floor or like in a different spot than, than the rest of the, the banks. But this was the first year that they had banks and fintechs together, just kind of mixed in. You can go and see the different booths all together. Um, so that was just like a very physical example of this, the changing relationships that, that we see. Um, and finally, a shift in funding sources, which I think is probably re less relevant for this audience. So I'll kind of skip over that a little bit. But basically, when we started doing blockchain projects, they were funded out of innovation budgets. And an innovation budget in any kind of company is never sustainable. You can get a couple hundred thousand dollars, and then when the project is over, where does it go? You actually need the product line to understand and want that product. Um, at that project. So uh, that, there's been a change in 2019 where the, the funding sources have moved. And, and that's been, for the private sector, extremely important. Um, deployment. Uh, so so this, this gets, you know, what happened, it, what is actually live. Um, so the first is what's, what's limiting things going live is I think there's been a slower move to cloud than we expected. Uh, you know, if you, if you really want blockchain to work well, to work quickly, and to get all of the functionality, you want it to operate in, in the cloud. Um, but to be totally transparent, most of our initial deployments were on-premises. Uh, that's what our customers were demanding uh, and asking for. Some of them were on cloud, but not all of them. Um, so that slowed things down. Second, um, we do have, we do, Deepesh, have live projects. <laughs> um, however, they're internal or domestic. So even if the project itself is meant to be global, um, so it, you know, it's an international trade corridor, it's starting with domestic trade, um, or it's starting with a domestic supply chain. Um, so uh, we do have international projects. I mean, Marco Polo, Voltron, these are all international, they're cross-border. However, you know, the, what is live and action, action now are those projects that are internal, um, just to one organization uh, or domestic. Um, and finally, we, we really do see large diversified companies moving first. And this, this gets to the question about, you know, what about inclusiveness? Uh, so what about small and medium-sized enterprises? Um, you know, when, when you initially have deployments, what you don't want is a company that would potentially be disrupted if the application tips over. I mean, this is, this is a new technology. Nobody's sure how it's going to work. So what we need to do is you start with a large company that if something goes wrong, okay, something goes wrong, it's fine. Like I used to work for Asian Development Bank, right? If there was a project that went wrong, I would get yelled at, it would be bad, but nothing would happen to the bank. Um, so that's a lot different if you're a small or medium-sized enterprise. Something goes wrong with your shipment, and that could potentially be the end of your enterprise. Um, so, so this is really where, where we see things in, in 2019. Um, and finally, you know, to, to Dale's point as well, we see a, a, a large rise in consortiums. Um, so companies in the same sector working together. This, this was a little bit of a difficulty in the beginning because, of course, there are antitrust issues associated with this. Um, however, you know, if you're really going to have a decentralized uh, technology work for the entire sector, for the entire you know, trading ecosystem, you need competitors to work together um, and to, to make sure that these work. Okay, so finally, this is, I'm just about done. Uh, so how, how are the platforms engaging with a global trade agenda? Um, and I, you know, I think there's, there's two different ways. Uh, the first is, you know, helping to build the, the global digital infrastructure. Um, because really the, the reason that, that we had problems with digitization in the past was because we didn't have the right infrastructure, right? You could have, a, uh, you know, an electronic document, but then if you sent it over to a country that didn't recognize electronic signatures, uh, too bad for you. Um, so what we see, what I see, actually, th this, is, this is very personal because, you know, I, I'm a trade economist. I've been working in trade for decades, and it's gotten to the point where I'm, I'm so frustrated all the time because we know what the problems are, um, and we haven't been able to fix it.
but blockchain is the first time that I've seen where the entire ecosystem is looking at the same technology. Not necessarily the same you know, platform or whatever, but they're looking at the same technology. And they're like, huh, how can we make this work for everyone? Well, the way that we make it work for everyone is these three things, right? We need the legal infrastructure. We, we, okay, we finally have to figure out how to make sure that electronic documentation is allowed. Um, there needs to be standards. Um, so, you know, what, what does a standard, in, what does an invoice look like? What are the different fields you have in an invoice? How do you fill out those fields? Um, and how do we make sure that that is compatible with other, other solutions and platforms? Um, and finally, consortium building. So, you know, it's, it's really about having regulators, having the private sector, um, having everybody look at this technology and go, huh, okay, what are the things that are wrong with this? How, how can we allow it to, to go forward? Um, and then kind of on the other side, you know, what we're doing as a platform company is trying to respond to trade-specific product requirements. Um, and so what are these? Well, the first is orienting towards the smaller suppliers. So we've actually had to change our blockchain a little bit to meet this. Um, so, uh, you know, initially, the, the way that Corda was developed is every entity had to run a node. And this was done because you have to know who your counterparties are. I mean, if you're a bank, you need to know legally who is running that node. Um, but that doesn't work for small and medium-sized enterprise. Like, if you're a small enterprise, you don't want to run a server. You, you don't want to maintain it. You don't want to update it. Um, so we had to, you know, re-architect our blockchain a little bit to allow for that. So now you can have multiple accounts on one node. Fine. You don't have to run it anymore. Fantastic. Um, the second is meeting security regulations. Um, so these are things like GDPR. Uh, you know, it, quite frankly, the GDPR was not developed with blockchain in mind, obviously. Um, and, but you can architect around it, and we've spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and finally, simplifying deployment. So, you know, the first deployments that we've had have been very difficult. Um, they always are. It's a new technology. Nobody knows how to do this. Um, but we're creating replicable processes to make that easier uh, going forward in 2020. I am not going to go through this at all, um, but this is just kind of like, you know, what are we going to see in 2025? Like, what is what is coming as a, as a result of this? Done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and I'm, I'm sure we'll... Thank you, and I'm sure we'll move on to that last slide in uh, a little bit later on in the discussion. I think the antitrust issues, and also to Dale's point earlier on, on cooperation, is very interesting and, and very pertinent to this discussion. Actually, I'd like to move move um, over to you, Bob. How do we accelerate the definitions of standards and hence interoperability? Um, and it would be great for you to talk about deliver and and your uh, vision for frictionless trade. Okay. Well, um, we're all here because we believe in uh, blockchain and it can have a huge impact on international trade, but. Um, yeah, what is the bank doing, Abe and Amro in this case, and why there's so much interest in this technology? You probably have already an answer to that, but I try to answer that uh, during these few minutes I have. Uh, but let's make a small step back. What is actually the problem we currently have faced with in international trade? That's basically the limited amount of transparency, which leads to risks, disruptions, and a lot of waste. Read costs. Well, that's because we have n uh, not really a means to interchange, do communication, and exchange data, so we have a good insight. Well, and if you already have now the data, probably it's already outdated because it takes you too much time and you cannot really trust it. Well, this transparency is not only a problem for your internal processes, because you want to be optimizing your own processes and have the lowest, the lowest cost as possible and the most value to your clients. Um, it also becomes more important to our regulators we, do we fulfill all the requirements related to uh, compliance, for instance? And our clients, our customers, our end customers are also more interested in it. Is it really coming from this farm? Um, is there no child labor involved, et cetera, et cetera? So in order to do that, we actually have to adopt some kind of new infrastructure. So we allow this digitalization possible and also change how we do international trade, actually revolutionize it in the future as well. So what will it bring? Well. It will bring us an inclusive ecosystem where everybody is basically included, even the small and, and uh, medium-sized enterprises we already talked about, but also the small uh, uh, producers in developing countries, which are left out currently a lot. Um, next to that, you as a data owner also much more in control. And it will allow us also not only to have the data itself, but to create some kind of digital twin. So we can be much be much more agile and automate our processes and make much more smart decisions. 
And on top of that, which also Deep has already referred to, we can actually create all kinds of new services, really be innovative and encourage this as well and make this available to many more participants in the whole supply chain and in international trade. Well, it has been mentioned already before and I feel like I'm repeating myself. If you look at the current ecosystem, yeah, there's a lot of puzzles, pieces already present. So there's nothing new, but they're kind of fragmented uh, currently. We have them in different uh, business cases, business use cases. Think about finance, maybe insurance or provenance. Then there are limits to geography, which also Alisa already mentioned. And next to that, it depends on the participants. Most of the times it's only the large corporates currently involved. And then it's also depending on the different type of technologies. It could be blockchain and then even the different tastes of blockchain which are out there. Could be cloud services, but also our old uh, famous uh, ERP systems and other legacy systems. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we can have this all inclusive ecosystem where we put all these puzzles together? And here's where blockchain can play an important role. Because blockchain really can create this digital infrastructure, this digital platform for international trade. Well, if you think about what platform basically consists of three different layers. It consists of a community and a network. Here's where basically all the users meet each other and connect. And on top of that, you have a whole network of producers which create this business uh, value added services. Well, in order to be doing that, you need some kind of infrastructure. We need to be able to meet each other, connect, and provide these services to the community. And then the third layer is the data layer. And depending on the type of platform, this plays a really important role or not. But if you think about uh, networks we currently know, like Uber, Facebook or Google, they really depend a lot on the data. And with the data, they engage the community. And the more community members they are creating data, it creates this whole uh, network effect. Well, I don't think um, this really works, this model, for international trade. So I started to work on a completely other initiative, and that's the name of Deliver. And Deliver is an initiative together with the Port of Rotterdam, Samsung SDS, an IT and logistics provider of Samsung, and ABN AMRO. And what we want to do is really create this community, this network, where people uh, in the international trade and community can meet and connect, have an opportunity to have all kinds of value-added services available to them through the network, and at the same time have an infrastructure basically which connects all these different puzzles together, all the solutions out there already. So we have a network of networks. And one of the most key important parts is we basically don't have any data in the platform. The data really stays at the source of the data owner. So the data owner themselves, he or she, can decide with whom, when, and how to exchange this data. In this case, Deliver is also a little bit of a special uh, example of a, a consortium. We're not of the same type of consortium members. We're in a financial institution, an IT and logistics provider, and a port, which makes already uh, something completely different. So it's not only doing something in the industry, we really want to cooperatively uh, change everything, just like what Dale already suggested to do us. So what makes it possible? If you look at the supply chain currently, there are many different members involved. And there is already a lot of information in a digital form normally available, but it's locked up in silos. And if we now communicate with each other, either we make a phone call, we do some faxing or emailing, or we hand over this paper document. Well, this we can actually already make some kind of uh, location to, to make it more in the digital form available. And therefore link the physical supply chain to the digital supply chain and put it back into the physical supply chain. So you have a digital real-time insight of how your trade is going and what is involved and what is the status. So basically we create this digital trim and connecting all this information together. So with that you can be agile, you can real-time make decisions and maybe automate the process you have internally and over your whole supply chain. And wouldn't it actually be fantastic if it becomes more and more digital available that this very linear process we currently know within the whole supply chain actually is uh, possible to make much more parallel to each other. For instance, if a ship sails, it sets out, you can already do your customs declaration in the port where it arrives. Well, this is very interesting from a bank's perspective because if you have this digital twin available, we as a participant in the supply chain also get much more information. Think about location, quantity, quality, temperature, etc. Any kind of thing which is either coming from an IT device or from one of the participants. With that information, we can actually reduce our risk, risk models. 
making actually financing much more cheap and available to many more participants in the supply chain. <coughs> this is the easiest way. And think about now a very traditional uh, type of uh, financing instrument, a letter of credit. Basically, a bank guarantees payment if you provide documentation, which is according to the conditions you set in this paper. Well, with the help of all these triggers out of the logistics supply chain, you could already have this information. So you can move in place for providing these documents. You can actually get payment on proven performance. That's already a big change if you can actually achieve that. And next to that, think about another thing is inventory finance. If you can prove your ownership, it doesn't matter where it is, if it's in your warehouse, on a truck, on a vessel, or on a train. If you can prove it's your ownership, it's part of your inventory, and it makes it also available to actually finance it. So these are all kinds of different models which would be available if we have this completely new ecosystem and this new infrastructure, where we can digitize it and really revitalize it, uh, international trade altogether, which makes it inclusive, more participants are part of it, we are in control of our own data and securely can exchange with each other, which mitigate basically the risks, avoid disruptions in the supply chain, and also lower down all the kinds of costs and waste related with the international supply chain. So yeah, if you believe in this, yeah, please engage in dialogues. We already mentioned it many times. We need standards. We need to be able to speak the same language with each other, not only on human beings, but from system to system, from ecosystem to ecosystem, from platform to platform, from network to network. And next to it, we also have to find out and understand what are the regulatory rules and regulations to make this feasible. What are the current guidelines, how we can use currently with the current rules and regulations to have this type of platforms available? And how do we have to move to the real traditional uh, world to sweep away and become completely digitized and become and make trade completely frictionless? Well, thank you for that. If you want more information related to deliver, please reach out to me or my colleague uh, Martijn Thijssen from the Port of Rotterdam. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, and, and really interesting approach on the idea of creating digital twins uh, within the freight forwarding space. I'm actually going to move on to one of the questions, which I think is, is, a, is a good segue into uh, Louise's presentation, which is, can you elaborate on some of the projects developed in developing countries, which was, which was asked during Alyssa's presentation? So, so Louise, over to you, and could you tell us a bit more about global trade solutions? Thank you to all the speakers um, and to Dupesh. Um, I'm really going to bring it down to the practical level because coming from Africa, I think um, we have different challenges. We have different um, opportunities. And I think, Alyssa, thank you for saying that a lot of the innovation and projects actually in terms of the blockchain space is happening in the underdeveloped countries. Um, and that's really been our experience also want to take you a little bit back from your avocado story where the first three um, pilot projects that was actually run around the blockchain technology side was a milk project from Seychelles, then machinery from Japan, and then flowers from Kenya, and that was in 2016. And if we really look where we've gone from there to now what you've very nicely put out, there's 39 active projects. Um, and as you set out, a lot of the projects are um, either up and running or running um, fully functional, and that's really where we stepped in. So um, a digitize, um, to digitize your supply chain is really the potential solution for frictionless trade. Um, as Gardner said, um, this is their definition of it, and one of the elements of this uh, process is actually blockchain technology. So naturally, coming from um, far away in Africa, when this blockchain um, prospect served um, in, in Africa, we as an organization looked at it and we realized that this is it. This is really going to make things different um, and that it could make the difference in, in terms of making an informed decision and not guessing. Data and information is the power of the future. I think all of the speakers alluded to that. And in our search um, of looking for a, either developing a blockchain solution ourselves or collaborating with a party, we ended up 
um, discovering tritlines, and we selected tritlines as one of our partners. But that was all good and well, because if you look at the requirements for frictionless trade, as defined by trade liens, it is connecting the ecosystems through information sharing, fostering collaboration and trust, and spur innovation. All of those things in the African context is not easily achievable and is very, very problematic. Secondly, if you look at the trade liens ecosystem, these parties are diverse organizations. Um, there's big organizations here, there's smaller organizations there, and we had to make all of them work together. So actually the challenge for us in terms of um, this approach to blockchain has not been the technology, it's been the people and the organizations changing the mindset, the culture, um, getting people to understand that they've got to work together, they've got to trust each other. It's very, very different to the way we're working today. If you don't implicitly trust and you decide to change your mindset, you cannot work in a blockchain environment. So um, really what we found is um, TradeLens was doing the container end-to-end -end tracking. What we discovered is that part of the TradeLens data that is needed to make TradeLens work successfully is actually either missing or incorrect or it's delayed. So we had to look at a way to solve this problem that maybe in Europe and America doesn't exist. We often, when we talk to... Um, our counterparts in America, they say, you're struggling with this? And we say, yes, this is a big problem. We can't get accurate data out of our port authority because in most of our cases, our ports are run in a different way. And that means that you cannot do your end-to-end -end tracking. So what we did, and this is just an example, talk about up-to-date real information. I hope that 27th of November still counts for that. But this is actually the reality of what uh, Durban is in South Africa. It's the biggest port in, in South Africa. And this is actually the reality, what um, the port, the access to the port looked like on the 27th of November. And this is not an abnormal day. This was a pretty normal day. Huge port congestion, vehicles standing for two, three days. It's just simply we can't keep on working the way we do. And a lot of it has actually got to do with the fact that we've got missing, incorrect, or delayed data. So um, in South Africa, we've got a saying, um, and I'm going to, is the Dutch people in the audience, they'll probably understand when I speak Afrikaans. We call it a boer maak a plan. And translated to English, it's a farmer makes a, I see our Dutch colleague understands. <laughs> translated to English, it's a farmer makes a plan. So um, we decided to actually make a plan around this bottleneck um, because the uh, um, Port Authority, specifically in South Africa, but it's been our experience in our research throughout Africa, is not able to provide the data to make trade lens work effectively. So we decided to fill the gap and develop a, I hope the gentleman from Dubai is going to allow me to use the words killer app. Um, which we've coined um, eDriver. And in essence, what the app does, it takes from the planning stage, so to prevent those vehicles standing for two, three days, you can actually um, upload what is the containers that needs to be collected um, into an uh, environment. You can then do your planning to actually allocate these to trucks and drivers. So instead of the driver going to stand there without knowing when or where he has to be, you can actually make it very succinct, succinct time around this. Then um, when the driver goes into the port, here comes the killer app. He's got an app on his phone where he's able to track and execute some information, collect the information real time for us, which was our problem both geolocation and time data, and also then containers and pictures of how it looks when he collected it. Um, he can then pass in and out of the port, all tracked online, and at the same time, the depot managers can see exactly where they are and what's going on, and through this, try and prevent this kind of congestion that we've seen um, um, as recently as the 27th of November. What we will also then do is from a safety and security point of view, um, the drivers can see, the depot managers can see where the vehicles are, if there's any congestion or any um, interruption. We've experienced quite a lot of um, 
um, violence in the uh, trucking industry in, in South Africa and also throughout Africa. If there's any congestion or any problems, they can route the drivers to a different location and on a different route. Um, and really what we found is that this improves planning and productivity. Um, two years ago, the uh, transport industry were, were, was it was possible to do four to five trips per day. They're currently doing one trip or even not a trip per day. It also can make costs um, management and profit profitability improve. So your vehicle utilization can improve, your direct cost can reduce. Environmental and health, um, less standing time, less em emissions, and also driver f fatigue and overall health improvement. Some frightening statistics have come out of the research of the drivers in Africa. Um, the level of diabetes is as high as 60%, and it's purely because um, of the way they operate, long distances they've got to travel. And then, very importantly, what we have found has been SME enablement. A small driver, and I think, Alyssa, you referred to it, if something goes wrong in a small environment, your total business can collapse. So what we've done here now is we can actually tell the smaller companies there is two or three loads that you can collect today, and we can guarantee that they can actually do that, which means they can survive and they don't run the risk of actually closing down their business. Um, so that's really, and I would like to use a quote from Nelson Mandela, where he always said it's impossible until it's done. And with our killer app, we hope by next year I can show you pictures of our ports not being so congested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, and I, I wish we used, we used that Nelson Mandela quote as, as well. I've, we've actually received quite a few very interesting questions, so I'm actually going to go straight into some of those questions. And the first question is around interoperability. This word seems to cover many aspects. What are the various interoperability issues that arise, and how big a problem is it? And I'm going to ask Dale and Alyssa to cover that question. So, Dale, perhaps we could start with you. I'm actually going to defer my nope. time to Dale. Alyssa. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Remember, and, I'm and on the uh, business and strategy <laughs> side. She's the technical genius. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay. That's because this is a really hard question. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> um, you asked for it. Pause the button. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, well, I, okay. So I have, I have some very specific thoughts about interoperability. Um, bef so before I answer that question, I think it's a word that a lot of people use and don't understand why they're asking that. So a lot of people say, like, oh, is this interoperable? What do you mean by that? Do you actually have an asset that you need to transfer between two different blockchains? Is that what you mean? Or does it mean, <laughs> is it that you need to trans, you know, you need to pull data from your ERP system to the blockchain? Um, or is it that, you know, you just need to be able to make sure that there's some, you know, sort of standardization between them? So, you know, the, the question is always, why do you need interoperability? What, what do you think you need it for? Um, you know, in, in my personal opinion, um, if you're talking about distributed ledger to distribute, so blockchain to blockchain, like, you know, corded to fabric interoperability, that's something today that I, I don't think that you really need. You can build it. And in fact, we had built it. Um, in one of our projects for Project Voltron, we showed that you could transfer an electronic bill of lading from fabric to corda and back. You can do it. But the thing is, with blockchain platforms today, they are not necessarily stable. Corda is. Um, but for example, you know, a, a lot of the public blockchains are not, like Ethereum is not. So you have, you know, a, a fork of Ethereum and suddenly your project doesn't work anymore. Um, or, you know, you have an upgrade and it breaks the bridge. So you can build a bridge, doesn't make sense um, today. Now, if you're talking about building the infrastructure so that in the future when the platforms are stable that you can do this, makes perfect sense. That's what we should be focusing on. So it's really, and if you mean interoperability in terms of like pulling data from your internal systems, like we use, you know, NetSuite today, you know, how do I make sure I get that data onto the blockchain? That's something we should focus on, right? Building out the API infrastructure. That makes perfect sense. Um, the whole trade standards discussion, which I think is going to be talked about tomorrow, that's something that everybody is actively working on. The different blockchain platforms are working together to make sure that there's standards that make sense so that when cross-platform 
interoperability becomes something that we can have, that it works. It will work seamlessly. It'll be much simpler. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Louise, I think you could put a possibly add something to that. <laughs> yeah, I think, Alyssa, um, talking from experience, um, naturally with us wanting to take ERP data, um, small vendors that have got no systems and also having trade lens around interoperability has got a different definition as how do you get all of this to work together. And I must be quite honest, it is achievable. Um, APIs and good documentation makes it actually very easy. So it can be done. Um, we are using different forms of technology in our solution, um, combined it into a blockchain solution. So um, interoperability from that aspect in our instance is actually being achieved. So it can be done. Thank you, Louise. Now, when, when the five of us were on, on the phone last week discussing this panel session, one of the, the take-homes was, was actually on, on the second question. Uh, just just there. Uh, we heard that we need to work together to overcome silos. How can we do that? And, and specifically aimed at, at a lot of the practitioners and policymakers here in the room, what policy actions could help? And what is the role of governments and inter-organizations and, and multilaterals within this sector? Bob. Yeah, to work together and to overcome silos in principle is not really difficult. First, the participants which want to overcome the problems have to find a mutual benefit. What is the use case you want to work on together? And if you find one and you have a mutual understanding of how you can solve it, it's very easy to work together. So in that way, it's quickly solved. You just have to reach out to other participants in the supply chain if you want to improve things. Next to that, of course, you have all the governments and the regulatory uh, uh, problems with that. Well, if you in, actually in find them or endure them, yeah, there's nothing else than try to reach out to them and get into conclave with them. Try to understand, make them understand what you want to achieve. What is actually the business value you want to create? And what is actually a business value from them if you actually solve it? Because transparency can also lead to much more insight for them. It's much easier to follow, for instance, if we are participating in international trade, are we following all the laws and regulations? It's much easier to follow it if everything becomes digital as well. So they become part of the problem, but part of the business value as well, and actually they have a solution to their issues as well. So I think that is the way to collaborate, basically. Find other participants in the supply chain, find a mutual understanding and a benefit for each other, and with that you solve all of it. It sounds very easy, but there's nothing else to that. We cannot solve problems if we don't communicate, and I think that is the biggest, uh, easiest answer I can give. And Dale, uh, leave it to you. So I brought up the word coopetition. Um, it's intentional. I used to say that blockchain is a team sport several years ago, and that continue people you'll hear that at that point coopetition kind of gets your attention it's not a word that you hear a lot um, I wish I could claim credit for creating it I didn't but it's a great word and I think it works here um, and uh, we talked about antitrust that came up earlier and um, certainly um, I've had very interesting internal conversations with our antitrust council uh, when they first heard that word and um, you may not remember, but when I had my slide up with my canyon, there's a little fine print up there in the corner that, <laughs> that our attorneys say hi. Uh, so that, that was part of that. Um, but the way I would say that is, it's not about where we compete, it's about where we can agree. Certainly, I know who my competitors are. I understand those things. And certainly, antitrust and similar um, laws are there for a very good reason and a very specific reason. And when I talk about the Blockchain and Transport Alliance, where I sit across the table from UPS or other competitors from that point of view, um, certainly we understand that's a hard line in the sand from that point of view. But we've always treated um, uh, antitrust and this competition thing is kind of a binary discussion. It's kind of an on-off switch. Are you a competitor? Yes or no. And I would argue that the coopetition aspect, where, where can we agree 
there's actually a lot more out there that we, than we actually have experienced. It's not really taught uh, in business school. It's not taught on your first day of orientation how to sit at the same table and work with people who are traditionally considered your competitors. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of great opportunity out there, and I'm leading with that in the blockchain space, but honestly, I think it goes well beyond blockchain. Um, I think it's optimization. I think there's lots of opportunities to do that, but we all have to do that, and, and if we are waiting, you know, there are a lot of people that are taking this on as a proprietary solution. I want to make some money. I'm in business to be in business. Let me make some money out of this new technology. How do I do that? And I would actually say that in many cases, that's actually slowing down the, the trajectory of what we're going to do. From our point of view, the coopetition, the how can we work together, where can we agree, we, we believe that the sooner we can get to this broader discussion where we can just calmly discuss this in a room such as this, where multiple nations are involved in multiple languages and multiple industries, and it's just something that we can talk about. It's not a, you know, we think that it's going to take an open, uh, uh, an open model, you know, the foundational layers, the hyperledgers, et cetera, uh, R3s, others as well. We think maybe a, a supply chain solution on top of that. There's going to be proprietary layers on that, but we just don't think we can skip to that step. We can't just jump there and do that. And so the sooner we can get this broader conversation where people say, yes, I get it, how can we work together? Um, when you hear the EU talk about here's the call to action, essentially, here's what we think we need to do. Um, I'm working in the state of Tennessee in, in the U.S. about how do we get something within the state, where we are talking about the same issues that Dubai was talking about, which is digital, which is identity, um, and how do you work with government services or state services, uh, academia, uh, large enterprises. Um, these are conversations we, as a group, we as a team, need to drive. So please, I challenge you, please drive these conversations when you get back to your day job because if we're waiting for other people to do it, it's going to be a long wait and we think we can accelerate this technology by driving those conversations. Alyssa? Okay, so just just one thing to add and I, I think this, this all makes a lot of sense. When we work with governments, it's often very difficult to figure out who to work with. Um, so blockchain is just a digital innovation, right? So, you know, we talk all the time about like, oh, you should really digitize. First of all, what do you mean? Second of all, who are you talking to? Um, so, you know, in the U.S. government, am I talking to Treasury? Am I talking to Commerce? Am I talking to USTR? Unclear. So in v there's very few governments where there's one person responsible for digital. And that makes it very, very difficult to, try to engage this way and to say this is what I need and this would be very helpful. So, you know, one of the things that, that I've been involved in, um, and this is with the ICC, um, Nicholas has been, you know, a part of this as well, is the, the digital standards work that they've been doing. And we had this commercialization exercise, right? So we, we came up with this roadmap for digitalization. So when you say, like, please support digital, this is what we mean. Like, here are the four things you can do. And it was incredibly difficult figuring out where blockchain would fit in. We're like, is it e-commerce? <laughs> like, it was... So, I, you know, I, I think we struggle with that from, from a private sector perspective. Who, who are we engaging with and what rules are we talking about? Um, you know, as, as well as, as from a regulatory perspective. So I just wanted to kind of add that in there. Thank you very much. And, and the ICC Digital Roadmap and, and the ICC Digital Standards Initiative, I think, are going to be discussed in more detail over, over the next two days. I'm going to move on to the second question now. And, and Louise, I'm going to ask if you can take that. To what extent do you think blockchain can help reduce the trade finance gap? So I I'm, I'm, I'm think we're referring to the 1.5 trillion US dollar ADB recent study, uh, which primarily came out of developing markets and MSMEs who, are, who, who struggle the most with regards to the trade finance gap. Um, luckily, this is not a difficult question. Um, I think that... Um, this is the one area where there can be a huge difference and a very easy adoption. And you can also see out of the projects, um, and thank you, Manuel, you provided a lot of the information in your report, which I read last night. The, this is the area where there's been a lot of blockchain activity and a lot of projects. Um, I think you, uh, Alyssa referred to a project in Nigeria. Asian Pay is another example um, in the Far East. And then there's some work being done with Mpesa and Kenya. And these projects are specifically aiming at the SMEs and enabling them to get to trade finance with l very low barriers to cost um, and barriers to entry. You know, cost is low, ad adoption is low. So I think 
this is the one chance we've got to really open up and give SMEs the opportunities that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I think I'm going to ask uh, Dale to ask the question uh, that, that's just come up because I think it's quite relevant to the people in the room. What can the WTO do to help businesses cross the canyon? Um, well, first of all, I, I congratulate uh, Emmanuel and the original uh, research paper and the one that has just been released. Um, the sheer fact that we're talking about this gets it out in the open. It's okay to talk about. It's okay for us to say, how can we work together? One of the comments was made earlier, uh, you know, I mean, nobody's going to agree. No industry, no government's going to agree to this technology unless it works for what's important to them, whether those are privacy issues, I'm not going to share my data, or I'm not going to, I mean, we have to work together. But, the, but, but if we think of this as a single team that we're trying to solve, the WTO is a, is a critical entity from that point of view. The uh, Global Express Association uh, and uh, our, our three members uh, putting together a position paper for the World Customs Organization. I also offered that to um, uh, as a policy recommendation here as well. Uh, the more we can drive that, the quicker we can get there. So maybe WTO, maybe WT, WCO, others can simply say, how can we drive this? Treat this as a challenge treat this as a as something to be solved rather than um, you know uh, one person or other people doing that take it on how can we actually drive that the EU how can we actually do those things and again there was a lot of wonderful things I took a lot of notes in that one and I've got to go to those those links but the more we can all take this on as this is something that is to be solved uh, U.S. government, we haven't even defined what blockchain is yet, uh, to the point that Alyssa made. Um, it, if you go to commerce, if you go here, driving that toward common definitions and common interests and common things, and, and WTO is, is, um, is a huge voice in that space. So again, that's how I think we can cross the canyon. Assume that we, it's going to take all of us to do it. None of us by ourselves are going to be able to successfully do that. And that's why WTO, uh, WCO, et cetera, are absolutely critical to this dialogue. Thank you very much, Dale. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, try and cover the, the last question now. And, and uh, Bob, I'm going to ask uh, your thoughts on, on this. It's, I'm, I'm going to reword the question slightly, but I guess it's around uh, we have very large, successful, efficient companies like Amazon who probably operate on more of a non-inclusive practice when it comes to logistics and shipping, yet inclusivity and, and open trade is absolutely key in terms of blockchain. Um, and I don't know, Bob, is this something you'd like to... You, what, what are your thoughts on this, Bob? Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, a company like Amazon, of course, relies a lot about the data that we actually share. Uh, I think many of the participants in uh, international trade really don't want to share data uh, to a company like Amazon. Um, so I think there will be always competitors to these large companies. I don't think there will be also just one solution, one blockchain for everything, for logistics or even for completely international trades. So I think if we have a choice, we always will find uh, priority solutions which are a little bit better or exclusive for the market you are actually looking for the type of business value so yeah Amazon might be a become a large player for many of the participants but I think uh, others will actually choose not to work with Amazon and maybe find other solutions to that so I hope this gives a bit of an insight and an answer to that question Thanks, Bob. And Dale, I guess over to you with regards to FedEx's approach to a white label or, or, or rather a non-labeled platform, which is enabling inclusivity within some of the biggest freight forwarders in the world. Right. We, um, uh, we've, we're part of multiple consortia. We get it. We understand that. Um, the point here, I think, is that we don't think those will scale. So if the, if, if the first three of us on this panel decide we're going to create a consortium, we're going to work together, uh, we, we, get, we stand up, we let the lawyers take over, she doesn't want this, he wants this, we finally get to a document that we can all sign, and we sign it, and then we invite the, the next two down the line, and we're all back at the table signing these documents and doing those kinds of things.
kinds of things. That's where we don't think it scales. When you can get to five or 10 or even 1,000, it's not gonna scale in the supply chain space. Um, that's why if we were to hang a, an open source license, Apache, MIT, whatever, out on the door and say, if you can operate within that, come on into the room, we think it scales globally. So certainly I appreciate the question from that point of view. We don't think that, we, we think that some of those types of things are more proprietary solutions. That's what leads us to this open conclusion. And so um, lots of companies are trying to monetize uh, blockchain. Um, certainly, um, you know, there are cloud providers. That one's a, a cloud and, a, and a, uh, you know, other types of things as well. We just, our default position essentially is at the International Space Station level. We go to 220 countries and territories. And when we pull back and look at that whole thing, we don't think any one of those, uh, whether that's a, a, spe a specific uh, consortium or others, are going to scale. That, that's where we come to that conclusion. It's a practical conclusion. It's not some altruistic thing where these are, they're such nice people, they just want to do this in an open space. We're in business to be in business, as are many other people. We just don't think it will scale without this. Thank you very much, Dale. Now, I'm very, I'm very conscious of time, and, and we're going to wrap the panel session uh, to a close very shortly. So I guess I, I will kind of cover the, the last question uh, uh, around taking a forward-looking view on, on perhaps the next one to five years. Um, so where are we now, and what might we expect for 2020? And Alyssa, is, is that all around new types of digital contracts? I, sorry. Um, I, I, I think, you know, what, what we can expect for 2020, for next year? Okay, all right. Um, well, I think, you know, what, what we'll be seeing next year is, is blockchain is going to become more, uh, it, it's going to become a lot less visible. Um, so it's going to be used already, and you might not know that you're using it, right? So people will say, like, oh, I'm a small and medium-sized enterprise. I don't use blockchain. Well, your bank uses it, and you use your bank, so you do use blockchain. So I think, you know, it's, it's going to become a lot more uh, common and, and less clear that you're, that you're actually using it. I think you are going to see different sources of financing. You're going to start to see financing at different parts of the trade process, because now that you do have that data, you can, you know, initiate these new financial instruments, which is kind of exciting. Um, and, and I think, finally, you're, you're also just going to see it um, a, a lot more globally. Um, people don't recognize that right now, even though it is global. Um, but what you're going to start seeing is projects that are hugely successful out of places you don't expect it. Um, so, you know, we're already seeing this, you know, from a platform perspective, but I think that will become a lot more obvious on the, on the global scale. Thank you. Um, Bob, over to you. Uh, yeah, I think you, what you will see is just like what Elisa mentions. It's like you see much more business value being created with the help of blockchain, but we don't really recognize it as being blockchain, which provides it. The infrastructure is not really visible. Just like the internet, we use our mobile telephone, no clue how it works, but we can use it. So I think we see that more and more. And next to that, because we have more transparency and visibility in the whole supply chain, all kinds of new uh, exciting kind of financing instruments will pop up and being offered to the clients. Uh, very nice. Also to clients which actually currently don't have access to this type of finance. And I mean, you think more of the small and medium-sized enterprises as well as the producers in the developing countries, which uh, had been mentioned earlier also. Um, and I think you will also see much more cooperation. I think that was the nice word you, Dale used. Uh, that you really see that all the participants of different uh, frames, legislations, geographies are starting to collaborate more and more. Um, at least if you're part of it. If you're not part of the community, of course, you just see that you have much more uh, chances to actually do uh, much more uh, international trade, much more efficient, much more transparent, and much more easy. I think that you will see already coming next year. Thanks, Bob. Louise. I agree with both um, Bob and Elissa. Um, we actually just need to step away and not even tell people it's blockchain because the minute you tell them it's blockchain, they get the fear of their life and they want to run a mile and you need to explain it to them. So I think you're quite right. Um, even our project, we've hidden the fact that it is a blockchain project. Um, it's it looks, <laughs> there's a mobile part to it, the rest of the data goes in, um, and that's made the adoption and the acceptance of the project. And I definitely think that's going to happen more and more um, that the fact that the technology is there is just irrelevant. It's just going to be a, a project that you can run with. 
Okay, and uh, over to you very quickly. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more movement in the open space. I think the power of we is a big power. That there's a lot there from that point of view, and I think WTO represents that uh, and others as well. And um, there's a lot of fantastic work, a lot of great passion going on in this space, and a whole lot more, I think, than what a lot of people uh, uh, realize. And I look forward to seeing more of that in 2020. Thank you very much, Dale, and thank you very much to our entire panel, Bob, Alyssa, Louise, and Dale. Uh, I'm sure we'll continue the questions over lunch. Thank you.